Okay, that was a great way to start. And uh, we're also not too bad in time, so I'm going to announce our second speaker now, Antonin Rouault, who is uh, studying psychology at the University of Fribourg. And actually, it's funny that um, I know Antonin from a few years ago, even before <laughs> I knew that he was uh, interested in psychedelic research when we used to jam together. So it's just funny how life works sometimes. You know, one day you may play music with someone and the next day you introduce their uh, scientific talk at the student conference. So um, Antonin, so I can add that he's also an excellent guitar player next to <laughs> doing research. <laughs> Um, he's going to present research about potential cardiac health risks of microdosing. So specifically whether microdosing could cause fibrosis. And even though maybe this might seem not as positive or optimistic as some of the other topics, I think it's just as important, if not even more so, given the hype around psychedelics that we often experience, and given that we do not want to glorify psychedelics, but follow the spirit of science and remain critical and objective. So please give a warm welcome for Antonin Roux. Okay, thank you so much for being here today. I am very excited to present the paper we wrote um, Abigail Kelder, Grigor Asler, and me on Oh, I've been baited. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> I was saying I'm very excited to present the paper we wrote Abigail Kelder, Grigor Asler, and me on microdosing psychedelics and the risk of cardiac fibrosis and valvulopathy, a comparison to known cardiotoxins. Um, yeah, I know it's not uh, that happy topics and uh, I hope I'm not freaking out any people who've done microdosing in the past or are actually microdosing right now. <laughs> 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 but um, you will know everything there is to know about uh, the risk of microdosing uh, and also all the things we don't know. <laughs> so first of all, what is microdosing? Well, uh, as you probably know, microdosing is the fact of taking a sub hallucinogenic doses of psychedelic, generally LSD or psilocybin, to achieve a variety of effects. Um, generally, it's taken several times a week uh, for several weeks or several months. And um, the research uh, effects are generally um, increase um, uh, focus, better energy, better mood, um, decreased anxiety, decreased depression, um, and uh, better emotion regulation. Um, these are uh, reported effects or expected effects, but um, when we look at effects that has been uh, tested to uh, control groups, uh, it's uh, a bit less uh, promising, sadly, but um, there was not a lot of study on microdosing. Uh, actually, the first study on microdosing was in 2019, so it's a very, very new subject to the psychedelic science. And um, there actually have been a study on the second most used psychedelic for microdosing, which is psilocybin. Uh, on this study, they uh, gave uh, individuals for a trial of two months uh, psilocybin, 0 0.7 grams of dried ganidoi uh, truffles, so psych psilocybin mushrooms, and they had to take five to seven times per three weeks uh, a microdosing, a microdose of the, of the mushrooms and they had to take uh, one day breaks in between doses. And uh, they tested for um, anxiety level, depression level, interoceptive awareness, and uh, emotion regulation. And they did not find any significant results in comparison to the control groups. So it does not mean that uh, we know for sure that microdosing is just a placebo, of course. Um, it's just... Uh, we don't have very much data on this. And at the time I wrote um, the articles, uh, 
I was on the 11 microdosing random control trials. Uh, so, yeah, it's just such a new subject and we don't know very much about microdosing. And this is also one of the reasons why it's so important to assess the safety of microdosing. And it can seem a bit weird to uh, question the safety of microdosing since we know that taking a single dose of classical psychedelic once in a while is not problematic. Um, but uh, there is some reason to think that uh, the chronic usage might be problematic. Um, indeed, there has been uh, uh, some compounds that share very structural, of that share structural similarities uh, to psychedelics that causes fibrosis, especially um, uh, cardiac fibrosis and valvulopathy. Um, so, very quickly, uh, it means that the valve of the heart is going to thicken and it's going to create malfunction that can cause arrhythmias or even in worst case scenario, heart failure. Um, this is uh, quite difficult to reverse. And um, there is also some other kind of fibrosis, uh, like for example, retroperitoneal or pleural fibrosis, but we will mainly focus on cardiac fibrosis uh, and valvulopathy because it's uh, one of the most problematic kind of fibrosis because uh, yeah, health failure is not great, obviously. Um, no, um, one of the first uh, substances that have been linked to uh, fibrosis is metisergid. So metisergid has been used uh, to treat uh, headaches um, and it has been linked to uh, fibrosis uh, in the past and a study in the 60s um, found out that if you discontinuated Uh, the um, intakes of metisergid, uh, the fibrosis would um, be less present. And if you start again the, um, taking metisergid chronically, uh, the fibrosis would come back. So it was clear evidence that metisergid was linked to cardiac fibrosis and um, they stopped using the drugs, obviously. And um, yeah, it's Uh, quite alarming because, yeah, metisergy does look very similar to LSD on a molecular level, and uh, it's not the only ergoline substance that has been linked to fibrosis. Um, there are a bunch of other compounds uh, that are all uh, related to ergoline, and uh, maybe uh, it doesn't seem that uh, problematic because, I mean, it's just some substance that looks like Uh, LSD or psilocybin, for example, but uh, they are very similar. Like, for example, metisergid um, was first synthesized in the same lab as LSD in the Sanders lab uh, from the same compound as LSD. So they are very similar. Um, and, uh, for example, ergotamine has been linked to um, cardiac fibrosis uh, and uh, anti migraine drugs uh, to treat uh, cluster headaches and uh, dihydroergotamine, same, it's an anti-migraine drug, and it has been linked to um, uh, fibrosis and um, uh, cardiac uh, vascu vascular heart disease. Uh, Carbogoline and pergolide, uh, both are anti-Parkinson's uh, uh, treatment, and uh, they have been also linked to fibrosis, uh, plural fib fibrosis, and uh, retroperitoneal fibrosis too. Um, and all of these uh, compounds has been, have been removed from the market or limited to uh, more uh, restricted use. Uh, for example, they still use carbogarline once a week, uh, I mean, maximum once a week to treat hyperprolactinemia, but uh, this is uh, not widely used and uh, Yeah, it's maybe not that great for an ID to use it. Uh, if it's only once a week, it still might be problematic. So, yeah, uh, still it's a good thing to avoid these substances. No, ergoline are not the only substances that are linked to fibrosis or um, vascular heart disease. 
and uh, substitute amphetamines are also linked to fibrosis. For example, the um, uh, norofenfluramine compound, which has been used as an anorexic agent in a very famous um, uh, me medication called fenfen, uh, which has norofenfluramine as the main ingredient, uh, has been linked uh, to fibrosis. They made a um, study on 223 participants, and they found out that 53 of them developed uh, fibrosis, and in the control group, only three of them developed fibrosis, so it was like a huge red flag, and uh, they removed norfenfluramine from the market, and it caused quite a havoc because uh, it was widely used, and a lot of people were asking for reimbursement, or there was been trials. It has been a mess. Um, and the other substitute amphetamine that has been linked to fibrosis is MDMA. Again, not a great news, sorry. <laughs> but um, yeah, a study found that um, uh, people who are using MDMA for six months um, uh, weekly uh, developed fibrosis like in 28% uh, of the case. So again, in the control group, none of these results were found. So the link to MDMA was, uh, the link from uh, MDMA and fibrosis was being made. But it was less strong than in uh, some ergoline compounds such as pergolite, for example. Uh, maybe because it was only a weekly usage and uh, not a daily usage. Uh, but I mean, it's just my hypothesis. But that was why I said that maybe taking pergolide once a week is not that great of an idea. Um, now, what are uh, ergoline compounds and substituted amphetamines in common? Well, uh, they are uh, all agonists of the 5-HT2B uh, receptor. So, um, this receptor has been linked to fibrosis and in the overstimulation of this receptor um, could lead to a valve thickening of the heart. And uh, they've made a study on mice which showed that if they uh, genetically uh, ablated the 5-HT2B receptor and gave uh, agonists of 5-HT2B, um, they would not develop fibrosis and uh, even the control group de did develop fibrosis, so 5 h 2 b receptor is indeed linked to fibrosis. Um, now, 5 uh, h 2 b receptor is probably not only um, a mechanism involved in the uh, uh, creation of fibrosis and vascular heart disease, uh, probably that uh, dopamine or uh, maybe 5 h 2 a as a role, but um, it's clear that 5 ht 2 b receptor is required, uh, is, uh, the stimulation of this receptor is required to develop fibrosis. Now, um, uh, yeah, before going to that, um, I've talked about agonist of 5 t 2 b receptor, but uh, those um, uh, antagonist of the 5 t 2 b receptor causes fibrosis, the answer is no, and uh, maybe it could even uh, prevent fibrosis, such as the drug um, tergeride, uh, which uh, is also anti parkinson drugs, I think. Um, so now the question is LSD and psilocybin agonist or antagonist. Well, they are agonists, so bad news again. <laughs> and um, there are also some agonists of favorite G2B receptor that do not, that do not cause fibrosis. So yeah, we don't put auto automatically uh, LSD and psilocybin to the uh, causing fibrosis category. But um, what does these uh, substance uh, have that is different from the agonist that cause fibrosis? Um, well, there is, for example, ropinirol or lorcaserine, which are both agonists of the 5 t 2 b receptor and that do not cause fibrosis. And um, 
this substance uh, binds more weakly to the 5-HT2B receptor than the substance that causes fibrosis, like methysergid or uh, ergotamine. And um, we've seen kind of a pattern, like um, the binding constant, Ki, uh, the, more, uh, the lower the number of this constant, uh, the higher the affinity with the receptor. So when the drugs have generally uh, Ki below 15, uh, it probably uh, causes fibrosis. And uh, when it has a higher Ki, such as uh, lorcaserin or ropinirol, um, the substance does not cause fibrosis. So now again, the question is, uh, is LSD, LSD and psilocybin, uh, does, it, uh, does they have um, a low Ki or a high Ki? Well, LSD does have a, um, a low Ki, so it binds tightly to the 5-H2B receptor, sadly. And uh, psilocybin doesn't bind that tightly, but its metabolite, uh, psilocin uh, does. So it's what's really count. It's uh, the same thing with uh, metisergid, which doesn't um, directly uh, cause a problem, but its, its metabolite, uh, methylagonavine, does bind tightly as an, as an agonist uh, for the favorite to be receptor. So uh, just looking at the, the affinity of the 5 h 2 b receptor, it's not great news again for the LSD or psilocin. Um, but now the question would be, does uh, a microdose of uh, classic psychedelic uh, would be enough to overstimulate the 5 h 2 b receptor? Because maybe it's just like such a small doses that it does nothing would be good. But, um, when we look at the plasma concentration of the substances that causes fibrosis, for example, cabergoline, we see that uh, usual doses of cabergoline, which is um, one milligrams uh, uh, intake by mouth, uh, is enough to create a plasma concentration of 0 0.04 uh, nanograms per milliliter. And uh, typical doses of uh, microdosing LSD, which is uh, 10 micrograms, uh, would cause a plasma concentration of 27 nanograms per milliliter. So it's way more. And both of these substances uh, bind uh, approximately at the same strength to the 5-HT2B receptor. Uh, it's the same conclusion for psilocybin. So yeah, if we're just looking uh, at the plasma concentration, uh, LSD and psilocybin microdosing would be enough to overstimulate the 5 ht 2 b receptor. So again, it's not a great news, but it doesn't mean that uh, it would cause fibrosis for sure. Again, it's just uh, data, and we cannot draw direct conclusion. It's just, we just can be aware of the risks. I don't want to freak out. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, there, there are some other details on the paper about um, molecular markers and the biological markers of fibrosis, for example, uh, transforming uh, growth factor beta, but um, yeah, it, it, if you really want to learn about this, just read the paper. I won't bore you with the details. But uh, yeah, we found, for example, that uh, MDMA uh, increased the risk of um, TGF beta. Uh, I mean, uh, more TGF beta uh, is an indication of uh, fibrotic activity. So this is um, uh, this is something that could be looked. Uh, in further studies. Um, I just remember something about MDMA while I'm at it. Uh, the Ki of MDMA was above uh, 500 Ki, and um, uh, it would mean that it's not that problematic, but uh, MDMA also releases serotonin, uh, so 5-HT, uh, which is also linked to 
uh, overstimulation uh, omits to um, causing uh, fibrotic events. So uh, that might explain why even though uh, it has a KI of 500 um, nanomolar uh, constant binding, uh, it causes fibrosis. Again, just an hypothesis. Um, no, we've seen that the duration of the intake takes a major role because uh, the chronic usage is really what's problematic. So uh, in future studies, it would be really important to uh, give breaks in between microdoses intake. So maybe every few months they stop for, uh, I don't know, six months period of time, just to reduce the risks. Um, also, they could uh, check for um, vascular heart disease using echocardiograms just to see if there is any um, uh, thing that could uh, lead to thinking that there is a fibrotic event going on. And um, uh, yeah, just um, that, yeah, that doing studies, being aware of that, and maybe, as I said before, uh, checking for biomarkers. Uh, because, uh, yeah, we don't want to give fibrosis to patients doing microdosing, of course. And, uh, yeah, it's just solely in the um, uh, microdosing research that um, yeah, we don't know much, but it would be good to, to look for uh, any potential uh, issue with the microdosing. Um, we could also uh, see, like, the Global Drug Survey, the biggest uh, survey on drugs, uh, they could add uh, some questions about the um, uh, about cardiac symptoms, and uh, maybe uh, with these big data we could uh, see if there is a higher prevalence of uh, vascular heart disease in patients who microdose, I mean, in individuals who microdose, um, in comparison to the person would do, would do not microdose. Uh, I mean, it could be nice and just including this in the survey. Um, and uh, yeah, it's just so important to assess the uh, risk of microdosing since it's gaining uh, so much popularity. And uh, this paper is a good reminder that we don't know a lot about microdosing. We don't even know if it's more than a placebo. Um, of course, I'm not saying that it's a placebo. We don't have enough data, so yeah, just make up your own mind and uh, be aware of the risk of microdosing. And it's not because it's uh, the same substances that you take when you take a single high doses once in a while that it's safe. Um, and um, yeah, that's about it. Yeah, some reference I had for doing this presentation. Of course, you can find all the reference uh, in the paper itself. And um, I want to make a big thank to uh, Abigail, who helped me so much for this paper. I wouldn't be able to do it without her. And of course, Gregor, who uh, made it possible. And uh, if I have still a bit of time, uh, um, I would like, in a more casual way, talk about the experience of writing this paper as a bachelor student back then, because uh, it was a bit weird. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't really know what I, uh, like, uh, how I should proceed. And uh, um, in, it was interesting because I, I felt like kind of investigating. So, oh, there is this favorite T2B receptor. And uh, uh, yeah, I did a lot of um, kind of useless work, just, okay, all of this was useless, but now I know. <laughs> and um, it was a bit stressful, uh, to be honest, uh, especially um, uh, I, uh, I made like the kind of uh, final version uh, of the paper. And um, uh, yeah, I, I took a bit uh, my time, uh, mainly procrastination. I wouldn't lie, <laughs> and um, yeah, uh, I, um, I gave the final paper, and uh, it was supposed to be published. Uh, we all agreed that uh, it was done, 
and uh, I went on a road trip. <laughs> And uh, in the middle of the road trip, I had uh, no um, internet connection. Uh, in a restaurant, I checked my mails, and I see that uh, there's been another paper on um, uh, microdosing and fibrosis that has been published. So I had to do revision of the paper. And I was like, I don't have a computer. I don't have internet connection. OK, what am I supposed to do? <laughs> and um, I kind of felt the fact that uh, yeah, you cannot redo really breaks when you, you're doing uh, this kind of uh, paper, like not until it's published. And uh, yeah, I don't know, it felt a bit, um, I felt a bit uh, quite of stress. And uh, I don't know, I wanted to share this because uh, I mean, I'm so happy to have been able to write a paper on psychedelic. It's really a dream come true. And uh, now that it has been published, I only want one thing. It's uh, doing another one <laughs> because it was really great. <laughs> and um, yeah, it's just uh, such a beautiful community. Uh, I really love like how everyone is really passionate about uh, the subject. And uh, we are all in very uh, different fields. But uh, um, yeah, we all uh, try to get more understand about uh, what uh, psychedelic does and how we could use it to um, treat people or to just understand better uh, how we work. So this is so great. And I want to thank every one of you just for being part of this. So yeah, thank you very much. Perfect timing. <laughs> <laughs> so we have uh, 15 minutes for questions. I'm sure there's a lot of questions. Hi, thank you so much for this. It was really, really interesting. Um, I had a question. I had two questions, I think. Um, the first one, are there studies looking at um, giving a 5-HT2B antagonist and the psychedelic and seeing if that had an impact on fibrosis. Um, and then also some psychedelics um, like 2CB are very anti-inflammatory. So is there any research on if there is a counterbalance of, yes, this might um, bind to the 5-HT2B, but then also have like anti-inflammatory properties that kind of counterbalance this? Mm -hmm. um, well, uh, sadly, there is been no studies and uh, combining an antagonist and using psychedelic. Uh, I mean, it would be very interesting. And that's one of the first thing I thought when I, I saw that possibly antagonist could prevent uh, the development of fibrosis. So definitely that's something that could be done. But um, yeah, again, it's just like an hypothesis that microdosing could lead to fibrosis. So yeah, I think probably would be something uh, maybe on mice or not on the human study. Uh, maybe it's going to be done one day. Uh, it would be nice, but maybe it's not like the top priority. But I definitely think at your point. Uh, and for your second question, I don't think so, sadly. Uh, but again, it would be very, very interesting. Uh, and uh, yeah, um, probably we're going to see some paper uh, being published about the subject. At least I hope so. Thank you very much. Very interesting talk. Uh, I always find it interesting to see like the more physiological side effects um, apart from the psychoactive effects. Um, my question, you showed the Ki, Ki values. Um, do you have some EC50 values or do you know if there are more like different biochemical values published? Because from my understanding, um, only looking at a uh, KI value is a bit of a limited approach? Yeah, it is definitely a limited approach. And um, uh, we are aware of that. But um, it's just to have a general uh, view on this. And uh, I think you can find something on the paper about, uh, about this. But uh, yeah, I didn't go too much into the details of this. 
and uh, I don't want to mess uh, and tell you some things that are wrong. So uh, yeah, I'm not that sure about if there were like if you could find any uh, like other way to associate the binding to uh, to the fibrosis and uh, yeah, if you are really interested about this, you can check on the paper directly. And if you have a like more precise question, you can always send me an email, and I would gladly respond to it. Thank you. Yes, thank you for an interesting talk. Concerning your final remark that uh, about how reinforcing you found it to get a publication. Uh, excuse me, can I repeat the question? Concerning your concluding remark about how reinforcing you found it to get a publication from this work, I'm just warning you that this can lead to a serious dependency. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but that aside, uh, v Victoria rather scooped my question by uh, qu uh, raising the question of whether you might fight pharmacology with pharmacology. And I did a quick search, and agomelatin, an antidepressant, uh, in fact is supposedly an antagonist, although I don't know if it would be useful to uh, uh, you know, co-administer a drug like that. But I guess the question is more, uh, the, the real question is whether there is a good mouse model that you could use to test for cardiac, cardiac fibrosis. So using a mouse model to assess cardiac uh, fibrosis? Uh, I guess there are such things. Um, Probably, yeah, but I mean, uh, not with uh, psychedelics, I think. I mean, not, not that I'm aware of, but I think this is definitely going to be uh, like the next step to assessing the risk of microdosing. So it's going to be on mice because, uh, yeah, we, I mean, otherwise, there is going to be other study on um, microdosing, but if we know that there is a risk, of uh, developing micro, uh, fibrosis while doing uh, microdose. Uh, ethically, that would be a bit difficult to, um, uh, to justify, like, uh, okay, we're giving a drug that may be cause fibrosis to the, to, the, to the participant. So even if we're doing breaks, uh, so yeah, definitely think that uh, studies on mice would be like the first step uh, to assess the risk of uh, microdosing. Um, so I guess I kind of have two questions. Uh, the first one is, uh, do you think it could also be a concern in the case of acute consumption instead of chronic? Um, like uh, taking a single high dose rather than a small dose repeatedly? Um, I mean, taking a single high dose once in a while is not problematic. And uh, we do have data on this. So rest assured. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and yeah, uh, the second question, I guess, was uh, in relative to tolerance. So there are many compounds uh, that when you take it at a small dose, it has an effect. Uh, and the effect can be the exact opposite at higher doses. So uh, do you know like, if there is a possibility that like, the effects is not like a linear curve, whether? Yeah, high dose doesn't necessarily mean high uh, risk in the sense. Uh, some people do micro doses, you know, so small dose uh, frequently. Uh, maybe the effects will not be the same if it's a uh, high dose frequently. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, this is a very interesting uh, reflection. And uh, I mean, uh, uh, again, we don't have uh, any data on, on this because micro dosing, it's just such a new uh, field of research. but. Uh, it would be interesting to see because yeah maybe maybe the uh, it would act in a very different way since it's uh, smaller doses so yeah that's definitely something something that should be checked in further studies yeah because i know you know with tolerance you could take really high dose very frequently without uh, being uh, completely out uh, just because of tolerance so yeah mm -hmm. Hi, uh, here. No, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay, so uh, I, I do not see DMT, neither 5-MeO-DMT in that table. So I am, I'm coming from a non-biology you know biology background. So those compounds would not have a uh, risk of developing 
um, you know, the, the fibrosis. So that is the, the first question. And the second question would be, how often does it categorize into chronic use? So I, I, I know that this is a fine boundary, but may, maybe still an open question, but could you provide some information into how often using a substance would categorize it into chronic use to kind of develop fibrosis or maybe even different diseases? Uh, well, for uh, DMT and other psychedelic, uh, I haven't really found that much data. And uh, since DMT is one of the least uh, um, used uh, psychedelic drugs uh, for microdosing, um, uh, yeah, it wasn't uh, the b big focus. But uh, yeah, it's like really a big gray area. We don't really uh, know much about uh, microdosing DMT. So yeah. Um, I think you couldn't say for sure that we don't have data, so it's safe. But uh, yeah, just keep in mind that other compounds uh, might be at risk. So maybe DMT2, maybe not at all. We don't know. And uh, for the second question, um, well, uh, chronic usage is kind of difficult to define. We kind of define it uh, in this paper as uh, at least two times a week for several weeks. Um, but as we've seen for the MDMA, uh, only once a week uh, for six months uh, was enough to cause fibrosis. So um, this is like the um, maybe uh, uh, less chronic <laughs> that you can get uh, in the link to fibrosis. Maybe MDMA is a bit different because it's, uh, um, it creates also a serotonin, but uh, for generally the uh, ergoline compounds, they were taken uh, several times uh, a day uh, for years. Like maybe uh, some, some compounds were taken for eight years before they realized that uh, they developed fibrosis. So it's definitely a very, um, uh, very high chronic usage. And uh, it may be just taking uh, once or twice uh, per week would not be that much problematic uh, and wouldn't cause fibrosis, but again, we don't know. And uh, it's just like assessing the potential risk. So um, yeah, the chronic usage could be from one per week to several times a day. Also, maybe a naive question, but um, the duration of the trip, so to say, has a correlation to the, the risk of developing fibrosis. In the, because, for instance, if you smoke DMT or 5-MeO-DMT, that has a very short duration, right? So would you say that that is probably correlated to, to the, you know, um, development, development of, of the disease? Um, so if I understand right your question, like if the duration of the trip is uh, smaller, it would be more problem problematic? Less problematic. Less yeah. problematic? Yeah. Um, well, uh, I uh, don't really know. I mean, we don't have any data on this again. I, I kind of just saying the same thing over and over. But <laughs> um, <laughs> OK. Yeah, I, I don't think, uh, um, I mean, we, we, we don't know. And again, TMT is a very weird compound. Uh, I mean, uh, yeah, uh, I think the focus is more on LSD and psilocybin, which are more like classical psychedelic and more used uh, on uh, for microdosing because, yeah, microdosing DMT again uh, is kind of uh, maybe difficult, especially because of the uh, time. So, uh, I mean, I would get people, I think, I would think that people microdosing DMT it would be uh, some kind of uh, pharma pharma or just a regular ayahuasca because uh, it would last longer and you could microdose with it. But uh, yeah, again, I didn't really focus on microdosing DMT because uh, yeah, it's such like a very, very small percent of the microdosing community. Makes sense. Thanks a lot. Okay, so then I have a follow up on this. Do you know anything about mescaline? Uh, <laughs> again, kind of uh, kind of the same thing as DMT. It's like uh, almost no one uses mescaline to uh, to microdose, and uh, yeah, it's hard to find uh, to find data on this. Uh, 
I don't think I've checked for the KI of mescalin, but uh, yeah, I, I think a, a quick research would maybe uh, would maybe point out uh, like if the risk is. I mean, if the if the mescalin has a higher or lower KI uh, than 15, you could it could also be a first um, uh, first indicator of the risk. Um, but uh, also you could check like how it affects uh, the 5 h 2 b receptor because, for example, um, LSD affects the 5 h 2 b receptor and the 5 h 2 a receptor uh, at the same strength, so to say, and uh, psilocin uh, affects the 5 h 2 b receptor even more than the 5 h 2 a receptor. Uh, so we know that with uh, psychoactive doses, it's definitely gonna um, uh, overstimulate the 5 ht 2 b receptor, and uh, yeah, maybe for mescaline it's uh, different, so although it would be worth checking out. Um, I have a question about the amphetamines. You mentioned, um, do you have any information if the ADHD amphetamine uh, medicaments are somehow investigated for links with fibrosis and vascular heart disease? Um, that's a great question uh, since uh, these are widely used substances but I did not come across any paper talking about uh, uh, ADHD uh, treatment drug and fibrosis so I would hope that uh, it's not problematic but maybe they just like missed it uh, I don't think so, but um, yeah, maybe it would be worthwhile to check if some paper uh, tried to research this and uh, like concluded that it does not cause fibrosis. But since I did not came across the, such paper, uh, yeah, I wouldn't say for sure. But yeah, I definitely hope that it does not cause fibrosis, and uh, yeah, I don't think so. Maybe we can take one last question. Um, I have a short question <coughs> about the study, study results you have been talking about in the beginning of the talk. Um, there was a study where the participants took um, 0 0.7 milligram of psilocybin for three weeks and five to seven, sorry, one days in one days of break in between. And contrary to popular belief, you told that. Um, the effects are not significant in terms of um, emotional regulation, stress and depression. And about this study, I just wanted to ask what kind of setting this was conducted in. Was it in a daily setting or in a laboratory or clinical setting? Because I think the results surprised us all. And um, I also know that the research about uh, microdosing is especially difficult because Ethically, it is not very easy to allow people uh, microdose in their daily lives, but that's probably the point mm -hmm. to see these promised effects. Yeah, um, well, uh, yeah, about these studies where they took uh, 0 0.7 grams of um, Galindoi truffles, uh, I think, if I remember right, that they uh, were able to just do their regular life and they were not. Uh, like confined to the lab for two months, which would be kind of weird, to be honest. But um, yeah, I, I know these results are um, uh, maybe a bit shocking because uh, yeah, plastic um, uh, microdosing is such a big thing, and uh, yeah, yeah, just imagining that it could be just a placebo uh, is weird. But it's not the only study, and I've checked several studies. And of course, I looked. Uh, to uh, yeah, if there were any studies that uh, found significant results uh, between uh, microdosing and the placebo group, and there were some significant results, but um, it was generally very um, specific, uh, especially like in uh, uh, creativity. So they, there is some significant results, but uh, it's not um, like uh, something. That re there is nothing that really pops out. Oh, it re it's really effective to treat depression or to increase focus. So, uh, yeah, um, uh, definitely the settings uh, uh, would uh, be a huge uh, would have a huge role on this. 
but uh, yeah, we just have to wait uh, until more studies are made to really assess um, if uh, microdosing uh, really do something on focused creativity, uh, mood uh, regulation, all this kind of thing. So yeah, for example, uh, we, uh, we for, for now we should just uh, uh, be very aware of the fact that we don't know a lot about it. Okay, thank you Antonin for your talk and the question.